So a month or so ago, I can't remember exactly when it was, I preached here from the first two chapters of Jonah. Um, and we looked at how Jonah had been called to serve God, to go and preach to the Ninevites, and how he ran away from this call. He didn't want to do it. He fled. He tried to get away as far as he could. And despite his best efforts, God caught up to him, rescued him from the open sea, and brought him back to dry land and towards his mission. And now today we shall have a look at what happens next. Um, Jonathan very thankfully read the passage for us, and let us have a look and see what we can tell from it today. So I know that a number of you have lived in a big city, whether that be Edinburgh or Inverness or Wick. Um, <laughs> uh, but you, some of you, even if you haven't lived there, I'm sure you've visited a big city, so you can imagine what it must be like to live a big, bustling metropolis. Um, people tend to live there tend to have very busy, very hectic lives. Um, consumed with all the pressing needs of that particular moment, so running a business or raising a family, maybe enjoying some sport or other activities, or maybe they just like to shop an awful lot. Um, but there's all, always something going on, always some activity or concert or sporting event. There never seems to be any quietness in the cities. So this is so similar, really, to what Nineveh would have been like all those years ago except without the cars and public transport systems that we have today. Nineveh was so big, in fact, that they reckon the, where it describes it needed three days to visit means it took three days to cross the city from one end to another. So that's how big and important it could have been. So I want you to picture something then. So you're walking down Princess Street in Edinburgh. You're admiring the same view of the castle that Angus talked about this morning. Uh, your arms are full of shopping, or you've got your bag on your back after a hard day's work, and you're just beginning the slog home to go and rest, put up your feet, have your tea, and enjoy your evening. When all of a sudden a strange, grumpy-looking man comes walking down the street towards you, bellowing at the top of his voice that in 40 days the city of Edinburgh will be overthrown and you will all be dead. So, how would that make you feel? How would that make you react. In all probability, you'd probably think that this guy was just crazy. You see them all the time, you know, those wandering around the streets with the sandwich boards on going, the end is nigh, you know, we see it all the time. So you probably just go about your days if nothing had happened, maybe mention it as a passing comment to your families when you got home. But that's what Jonah did when he walked into Nineveh. He walked straight into the busy city and as soon as he reached it, he said, as we read in verse 4, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. As is usual with God's prophets, Jonah didn't mince his words. He went straight out and said what God had told him to say, that in just over a month, all of you people will be dead. God's word always seems to hit people when they need to hear it the most. It tends to turn our view away from our own interests, our own desires and activities, things that consume our lives, and point us to the looming and overwhelming reality that we are facing either everlasting destruction or eternal life in glory with the Father. Then Jonah the prophet comes along saying, whatever it is you're doing right now, you need to stop. You need to listen you need to realize that you will soon face the judgment of God and that day is coming much sooner than you think. But there is a way out from this. God is giving you a second chance and here's what you need to do. The message of Jonah 3 and indeed the message of the gospel is that we all get a second chance. Amazingly, the people of Nineveh responded to Jonah's preaching with heartfelt and genuine belief. They gave up their old evil ways, they repented from their sins, and they turned towards God. The proclaimed word of God brought by Jonah to the Ninevites began belief in them, ignited their prayer lives, and produced true repentance in people who had up until this point had expressed no prior interest in God or his word, or have felt hostility towards it. 
Here we can see the work of God in the hearts of these men and women, the hearts of these previously wicked pagans, to change them, to bring them to repentance and to faith. A message of hope that we all need to hear today, that God can bring even the most difficult person that you know into faith and to believe in him. Repentance and faith are generally two sides of the same coin. One cannot exist without the other. Repentance is only possible where faith is present, and where there is faith, repentance will also be found. Faith comes from a spiritual awakening to our own need and to God's glory, an awakening that only God himself can bring. Repentance is a gift, a gift that flows from God, that flows from our faith. It is the evidence of a genuine faith. And this is what happened in Nineveh when Jonah went and proclaimed God's word there. The three days and the three nights that Jonah spent in the belly of the fish were for Nineveh and for the Ninevites the sign of God's great mercy for sinners. In the same way, Jesus' death and his resurrection three days later is a sign for us. The good news of the gospel is that God has poured out on Jesus the wrath that we deserve so that we may not perish, that we may not be overthrown. The death and resurrection of Jesus gives us every reason to hope and have joy in the mercy of God. So three points from Jonah chapter three for you this evening. The first being the obedience and mission of Jonah. Now, I'm far too young to remember the old television show Mission Impossible, but I am somewhat familiar with some of the more recent movies starring that great but small in stature actor Tom Cruise. But there's a certain catchphrase that is is synonymous to both, that's that's really, really well known, and I wonder if any of you can remember what it is. Is anyone gonna be brave? No? None of the kitty winkies. Looking at you, Anna. No? Your mission should you choose to accept it. Come on, you must have known that. It's one of the most famous and well known lines from any film or TV series. And in Jonah chapter 3, we see God giving Jonah his mission. God calls to Jonah in chapter 1 and says to him, Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go to Nineveh and preach to them of the destruction that I will bring. And in chapter one, Jonah does not accept his mission, but runs away. In chapter three, after being brought back home by God, by being saved by him, God gives Jonah a second chance. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, Jonah, is to go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the the, the message that I give to you. And this time, Jonah accepts his mission and goes to do God's bidding. God gave Jonah a mission. Jonah tried to decline this mission, but God would not let him. God's will in this mission was sovereign. He is in perfect and complete control of every situation, despite what control we think we may have. He would not allow some overly patriotic angry Jewish prophet to keep him from performing what he wanted to do. In chapter 1, we saw Jonah running away. In chapter 2, we saw Jonah running into God. And in chapter 3, we see Jonah instead running with God. There's an incredibly important lesson for us in verse 1 here. As Christian, God could ask us to do things that we possibly really don't want to do. And I'm sure he does so quite frequently. And so many of us probably react like Jonah did initially by running away. Heading straight in the opposite direction, trying to ignore what we've heard from God. And Jonah did the same. But this time, Jonah heard what God had said. And even though he didn't want to do it, he stopped running and he turned and obeyed God. The command Jonah is given in chapter 3 is slightly different from what he was told previously. In chapter 1, verse 1, 
God told Jonah to preach against the city at first because of its great wickedness. That maybe gives us an idea when we first read it that possibly God's going to destroy the city. He's going to bring about their end. You can see this commonly in the Old Testament where God has destroyed sinful nations in the past. But now it's different. Something's changed. God simply tells Jonah now to go and preach to Nineveh the message that he will give him. This is quite significant because it's intended maybe to prepare us to, maybe to change our minds, make us think about how the story is going to end. It's a foreshadowing of what might be about to happen. Up until now, we could have been thinking, and rightly so, that God had been intending to destroy Nineveh as he had done with sinful nations in the past. Now, however, we can maybe have doubts about this. Maybe God doesn't want to destroy Nineveh. Maybe he has something else planned for this great city. As a side note, this type of mission is slightly different from what we might expect to hear in some of the other Old Testament mission calls. Nearly all of them have the, the prophet or the speaker or God going out to the nations surrounding Israel and telling them to come and see what God is doing. But here is something that we'd see much more commonly in the New Testament. God commands Jonah not to wait for them to come to him, but he instead tells him to go and tell them to go to the people where they are, to tell them what they need to hear, where they live. Too often in our culture, we think maybe it's, it's enough to come to church. It's enough to occasionally bring our non-Christian friends along with us or invite them to events. And these are good things, don't get me wrong. It's great to see visitors and guests and new faces in the church, but sometimes I think that maybe we're missing something. The church is indeed for worshipping and praising our Creator and King. It is indeed for the welfare and the caring of its people. But it also has to have a role in training, equipping, and encouraging believers so that they can, like Jonah, go and tell people the good news. When the church adopts the come and see mentality that we can see in some denominations, they are not becoming what Christ wanted his church to be. They are not doing what God's given mission is. This is probably one of the reasons why so many churches are dying today, because we are running away from God, hiding in our pews, and waiting for them to come and see when instead God is telling us to go and tell them. Are you here today to learn about God, to draw closer to him? That's good. It's great. It's brilliant. But if that's all that you do with it, Are we missing something? Are we forgetting God's great commission to the church? Take what you learn and go and tell others what you know so that they may be saved. Jonah learned from his ordeal with the fish. It's a lesson he does not need to learn again. God told him to go, and this time he goes. God gave him a second chance to complete his mission. God rescued him from his misguided attempt to escape and sent him to give a second chance to this evil city and its evil people. Jonah went to Nineveh as God had commanded and he proclaimed the message that God had given him. Now we aren't told the full details of what Jonah said, but I think it's possibly safe to assume it was more than just eight words or five words as it is in the Hebrew. You may remember when Jonah told the sailors that he at least told them that it was the Lord, that it was Yahweh who he was running from. But here, he just seems to tell them the bare-boned minimum, that in 40 days, you are all going to be overthrown. Now, it's possible that Jonah hoped that by giving them this bare minimum message that they will not listen and that they will be destroyed. But I'm not really personally totally convinced by this. And I wonder if the author, whoever he was, is playing down Jonah's skills as a preacher, playing down on his rhetoric. It takes the focus of the repentance that we see in Nineveh away from Jonah's skill, away from his preaching, 
and fully into the hands of God. Angus talked this morning about the Holy Spirit working in our lives to change us, to bring us into God's grace. And here we see something similar. God changing the hearts of the, these people by using his prophet, but with all the hard work being done by God. There's also something fairly interesting in the, the use of Jonah's language with the word overthrown. Overthrown or overturned gives the impression that we may have thought earlier that Nineveh will be destroyed or annihilated. It's used in the same way to describe the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah back in Genesis 19. But an another way that it's often used in Scripture is with the meaning instead to be turned, as in to be turned away from their ways, to turn around, to become something new. In the same way God turns our broken, sinful hearts into righteous, saved hearts. Jonah didn't like the Ninevites much. He wasn't really keen on them. And he probably was thinking that they were going to be destroyed for their wickedness. But here we see that in the message God gave him to speak to the Ninevites, there's another possibility. This is again a foreshadowing of what is about to happen, of the great surprise that is going to be facing Jonah and facing us. This also shows us that Jonah's prophecy came true as well that Nineveh was overturned, that they were overthrown, but not in the way that Jonah had hoped or that he may have expected. Leads us on to our second point, the repentance of Nineveh. If you'll turn with me now in your Bibles just to verse 5 of chapter 3, we're going to read a little bit more together. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone urgently call on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The, the Ninevites believed in God. Jonah was the one speaking, but it was the message of God that they were hearing. They responded in full from the greatest to the least from the king on his throne to the beggar on the streets in verses 6 and 9 we see how the king reacted how he started a great transformation we can see that even the king the most wealthiest powerful man in the city responded to the message of God and what does he do he calls for nationwide repentance. Not only does he want all the people to fast and to pray and call urgently on God, but he wants the animals to fast as well and be covered in sackcloth. The repentance here in Nineveh is genuine. It's not just an empty apology such as when a child does something wrong and knows that if I say sorry, I might get off with it. It is someone, a group of people, a great city who are turning away from their evil ways, turning away from their history of violence towards a new way of life. Genuine, genuine repentance is to change one's way of living, to shut away your old lives, to lock it away in the past, and to open the door towards God and serving him instead of serving yourselves. Their hope is that God will yet relent, that he will turn from his anger that is upon them and not destroy them as they feared. That God would hear their cries, would see their repentance and give them a second chance. Now it's pretty serious business when the leader of a nation repents before God and calls upon everyone else in that nation to repent 
as well. Could you imagine Nicholas Sturgeon or the Prime Minister hearing this man crying in Edinburgh for repentance and listening to him and acting upon it? Probably not. But he did. God called on that whole nation to repent and it started with their king, their leader. Generally, there's a pattern in the Old Testament that a nation follows the example of their leader. That if their leader is godly and follows God, then the nation will also. But then if the leader falls into sin, falls into idolatry, the people tend to go where their king leads them. It's really the same today. It hasn't changed. Our leaders, our politicians often think that they're just giving the people what they want. But in reality, they are shaping the nation into what they are, not what God wants it to be. Often the nation does become like its leaders, which is quite a scary thought when you see some of the leaders we have rocking about in our world today, causing havoc wherever they go. In this case, the king that led this nation in repentance before God called on his people to do the same. He commanded there to be fasting, for there to be prayer, for everyone to humble themselves before God. We here today, though we have leaders, we are slightly different in that each of us is a leader ourselves in one way or another. We may be the leader in our family, we may be the leader at work or at church or in our community. Many of us have leadership roles that we follow. Leaders lead not only in vision and direction, but in repentance and holiness. The king was doing the right thing here, though he knew so little about the God he was repenting to. He did the right thing. Jonah, some, for whatever reason, did not give them the courtesy of knowing who was going to destroy them. Because, unlike the sailors, they did not call out to the Lord. They called on God without knowing fully who he was. But nevertheless, God heard their cries. He saw their repentance, saw that they were turning away from their wicked ways, and he gave them their second chance. Did they deserve it? Not at all. Did they do anything to earn it? No. But God spared them death and destruction and instead gave them life. He changed their hearts. He saved them. God showed them mercy in an astounding way by using a deeply flawed man, a bitter, bigoted, antagonistic prophet whom God used as his instrument for one of the biggest expressions of divine grace in history. Jonah was certainly a very unlikely hero. God is our gracious savior. His loving kindness is not limited by us. He's not limited by our prejudices, by our pride, our indifference, our sin. His loving kindness and compassion and his grace are not limited to those who are so-called good, the so-called good people of the world. But he extends it to the worst, the most brutal, the murderous, the idolatrous pagans, and to us here today. Let us lead us on to our third point, our second chance given by God. This is really the heart of the gospel, that God is the one who created all of us, and how did we repay him for his love? We sinned against him. We rebelled against his rule, against our own creator. Wrath and judgment is what we face because of this, and rightly so. Except no, because we are given a second chance. We have been given the gospel. We have been given Christ. Christ who offers us forgiveness through faith in him. You can really see the gospel at the heart of jo uh, the story of Jonah. The creator God, the one who is sinned against, warns them about his judgment 
and then he fully forgives them, fully, in, for, fully forgives those who repent, and he embraces them as children. I was going to read to you a few words from Second Peter chapter 3. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter reminds us that God is neither slow nor is he forgetful. He is not faithless to us, despite our faithlessness to him. God's loving kindness is everlasting. He will ensure that his saints will persevere, not ultimately because of our faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness to us. One day we know that Christ will return, and while the wicked, those who turned away from God, those who rebelled against him, will see that their sneering was misplaced, the faithful will see that their hope and their salvation was true. God's vision for the world is that every square inch will be covered with the knowledge of his glory, like the waters cover the sea, God's renewal will come and will one day wash over the, the world to restore all things, just as he restored Nineveh. Will God give you a second chance? Yes, he will and more. It's not baseball, if you ever have the patience to watch it. Three strikes and you're out. Not at all. When we turn in repentance to God, we are forgiven for our sins, past, present, and future. Does that mean that we can just keep sinning, sinning and not caring, however? No, it doesn't. Because like the people of Nineveh, we need to turn away from our old lives and turn towards God, turn to his saving grace, and do our best to live our lives in service to him. God saved Nineveh not because they deserved it, not because they earned it, but because he loved them, because he wanted to save them, just as he loves you and wants to save you. And he gave up his son on the cross for that purpose, for that reason. Through Jesus, our past lives are forgotten and we are given his righteousness instead of our own broken sinfulness. God is sending his word into the world. I ask, will you listen? Will you repent? Will you trust in Jesus? If you haven't yet, now is the time to do so. For the time we have left may be shorter than we think. It doesn't matter how unredeemable you may think you are. It doesn't matter what you may have done. God will give you a second chance. God will save you. If God could save Nineveh despite their evil and wicked ways, then he can save each and every one of us. And then once we have that knowledge, once we have that truth, will we be like Jonah? Will we go and tell others so that they too may know and be saved by the grace of God? Amen. Father God, we just give thanks to you for this word. We give thanks for the story of Jonah, a man so flawed, so broken, but you used him for your purposes. You used him to save the lives of many hundreds or thousands of people in the city of Nineveh. 
And we ask for that we would learn from his example, not from his bitterness, from his hatred, but from his willingness to serve, his willingness to go and tell people the word that you've gave him, his willingness to serve you no matter how he felt himself. May we go where Christ calls us to go. May we proclaim the message that you give us to others. May we wait and hope for God. May we, be, may we escape from being bound up in the busyness of this world, but live in readiness for the coming of the kingdom and go and tell others of the great mercy and grace of God which we have received and that everyone has the chance to receive. Amen.